Now, some of them go down into uh, into Africa. Some of them go deeper down into Africa. Uh, some of them go into Iraq. Some of them go into Iran. Uh, but for the most part, many of them, many of the patriarchs will go into I Iberia Peninsula. And these, and, and, and remember the Atlantic slave trade was there as well. We have those Muslims involved in the slave trade. So, so much happened with this Iberia Peninsula. So we have these uh, patriarchs leaving. They are exiled. They are looking for land. And so they settle here. And so I'm thinking that these people were more vulnerable when they settle here. And some going to Africa. It is the ones that go into Europe that really interest me. These are the ones, the ones in Iberia Peninsula, they really interest me because these people in Morocco, because again, this is where the Moors come from. This is where they, they said this is their home, where they come from. Okay. They have always stated that they come from Africa and that they are from the Iberia Peninsula. They never, they never say, and they are right to some extent, but your generations have been in ancient Egypt so long, y'all might as well have called yourself Egyptians. But no, you called yourself Africans. Okay, I guess that's the same thing as in Africa, so we can go with that. But ancient Egyptian, Ancient uh, Egypt is a bigger empire, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, okay? So they settle into, uh, they go into Iberia Peninsula, and they were not wandering around in the wilderness like the Bible said, that, that, you know, they just moved in different areas. That's what happened there, okay? They were exiled from eat from the Egyptian Empire and had no choice but to settle in, in other lands. These he, these people had superb skills in math, science, astronomy, and medicine. They learned in Egypt. This was the beginning of Moorish conquest. It is then these people are simply called Moors. They began. People start identifying them as Moors when they go into Spain. Uh, or into Europe. That's what they seen as because they're identifying them by their description. Okay? They identified them as it, and they didn't correct them. And when people asked them where they're from, we're from Africa. They never told them about this other story, but they still have the story, their science, everything intact. Okay? These people still have their story intact. They got it written down. It's intact. Okay, they go into the Europe. No one knows that much about them. They claim they come from Africa. It somewhat was true because they migrated from ancient Egypt after they were exiled. Okay, so this is so much true. So that, that it is somewhat true. Moors crossed over the Strait of Gibraltar and started their conquest of the Iberia Peninsula. Okay, when they when they crossed there, they started. It was the Berber commander who led the attack. No, oh, I'm sorry. It was the Moors who led the attack on the Berbers indigenous in North and in, uh, the North African tribe. So you had these Moors coming in here and the Berbers that was already in there, the indigenous people was already in there. They began to attack those tribes there so they can take over uh, the peninsula there. Remember me telling you these Afrin people were exiled. They needed to find land. And so I'm thinking that these people were very probably vulnerable and they were easy to overthrow. They were not called Hebrews. You know, again, these people were not called Hebrews or Israelites. It's important to note that these patriarchs learned many skills from the matriarch culture. Many were born in Egypt. Technically, like I said, that makes them Egyptian and very knowledgeable about the matriarch empire and lands. 
They were exiled during the Egyptian expansion into Africa. So when you see that, uh, see the Egyptians in Africa, there was an expansion uh, thing. That's why you have the pyramids and, and mounds over here in America that's older and more advanced than the pyramids in Africa. Africa was going to be, was being colonized by ancient Egypt, which is in ancient America. And you will see, you've seen some of those artifacts, ancient Egyptian artifacts here in America that predate the ones in Africa. Okay. And they were quite, they were quite knowledgeable that this was a matriarch empire and knew how big it was. For the next eight years, military and campaign fought vast majority of the Iberian Peninsula, Peninsula under Moorish rule. So they overthrew all the original inhabitants there. They staked, they claimed down on the land. Morocco was born. You got Morocco uh, close to there. And they're settled in there. So they have a straight way into Europe. You know, they have a straight way into Europe. and they can continue with their conquest. And they did. That they did. The Moors were determined to make their mark on the world, and they did. Next, we see the Moors going to Europe with the Renaissance. Oh, they bought so much to the Europeans. Moors who bought their own history, their science. Many people think Moors means Muslim. That is simply not true. Europeans also use this word to describe the features of dark people. The Moors that entered Europe did not correct the Europeans. They didn't say, hey, I'm not this, I'm that. They didn't connect them, you know, just say, you, you, you're a Moor. Just like somebody said, oh, she's a black woman. Well, not correct them because, yes, I am, I'm black, you know. So they didn't correct them. They had no reason to say, hey, no, nah, I'm from here, from here. You know, that's when they could, intentions anyway, they, they came in to conquest. They came in to see how they uh, could grow in this society. They were, they were trying to take over, okay? They're trying to bring this patriarch, uh, make this a, a worldwide thing, okay? Uh, many of them, okay? Because that's where they come from. They come from Sumer, they come from Ur, and most of these men, you know, from there, they're supposed to be, you know, they think they own women and children, you know. They don't have matriarch ideologies. So they're, they're, this is where you see this patriarch ideology uh, being born in. So you see uh, they go into, uh, into uh, Europe and they are in a renaissance. During its peak, Cordova, the center of Moorish territory in Spain, was the most modern city in all Europe. The streets were well paved and pedestrians could walk on the raised sidewalks. At nighttime, several Streets were often illuminated with lamps. Cities like London or Paris featured paved streets and lamps only centuries later. Agriculture under the Moors under under the Moors underwent huge development. Of course it did because they learned everything from matriarchs. The matriarchs had uh advanced technology when it came to agriculture because they were feeding so many of the people. And then you, when you look at ancient America, they have vegetation and things here that is indeed just here that you can find in Africa, which shows that ancient America was trading and was uh, that ancient empire was feeding Africa. It was there. They were feeding Africa. You know, you'll see a lot of plants and vegetation that's indeed just here in the other side of the world, which shows you that ancient America had global influence. Ancient America, ancient Egypt, uh, this matriarch, impu, uh, matriarch imp empire had global influence, okay? Moorish influence led to the establishment of large number of wells, reservoirs, and canals that redirected the water from one region to, a, 
the other. As a result, agriculture production in the region surged. So where they learn it from? They learned it from Egypt. They learned it from the pre-Columbian civilization from ancient America. And I'm going to show you. Are you seeing ancient America? Are you seeing some of the resemblance? The ancient America or pre-Columbian civilization lived in a tropical environment and had to be innovators. This was a remarkable, a remarkable innovation. A lot of people look at indigenous Americans in the Western Hemisphere as not having the same engineering technological muscle of places like Greece, Rome, India, or China. But when it comes to water management, the pre-Columbians were ahead of their time. Okay, so you see that here. And they they uh they have just started to uncover some more temples and cities and structures in the Guatemalan area in South America. We had we had advanced monuments over here and waterways over here. We had already had that figure out in the Americas. Okay, that's why we were able to feed our people. It was such a beautiful oasis over here. Everything was plentiful. You can find fruit trees and things everywhere. There was no hunger. This was the matriarch empire. No one had to worry about, you know, starvation or anything like that. Okay. And this is where this this is where these Moors learned this from. They learned it from us. They were uh, in ancient Egypt for years, they would have had that education. They would have learned Freemasonry. Moses would have known Freemasonry. He was raised in Egyptian, uh, in the Egyptian esoteric occult knowledge. He would have had that information. Okay. Do you see the resemblance side by side? I wanted to put these side by side so you can see the resemblance. Are you seeing this? And this is the things when the moor is left, we start seeing structures uh, being erected like this because they learn from ancient Egypt. They learn from the matriarch culture. It looks like they took the skills with them. You can find similar cities right here in the Americas. I believe that is why they don't want to go digging around in ancient America. The entire African theory comes apart when they go to look how old ancient America really is and to see its global influence on the world. It dismantles it. It dismantles that everybody is from Africa theory, and that's just not so. It's just not so, and they're, they uh, they are getting ready to unveil all this knowledge, you know. These are things that I did not want to talk about that I have held on for years, you know. I wrote portions of it in my book, which my book talks about a lot of this information. You know, I blow the whistle, especially when it comes to the Moorish and biracial children. We'll talk about that a little more as we move on. But I want you to see these similarities, how they have took this technology and advancement in architecture and construction and took it to other places. And that's how they were able to advance Europe, take Europe out of its dark ages because they learned all of these skills from ancient Egypt. Okay? They learned it from their matriarchs, the matriarch empire. We didn't mind. We wanted our people to be educated. We didn't mind uh, sharing those skills with the with them. Uh, we will learn that the indigenous people in Americas were the first to civilize the world. They were first to civilize the world, and you're going to see that um, as that information uh, begins to become unveiled. It's going to change uh, how they write history books. If, you know, yeah, I don't know, because we don't know. I don't know who writes these history books these days, but it's really going to change how we look at history and how we teach history uh, when we find out that people of color were already here. Okay, let's let's jump back in to seeing who these Moors are.
And in medieval uh, Europe, Muslims were commonly known as Moors. Since initially most of the Moors coming in Europe were from Africa, the term came to be associated with African Muslims. And we'll talk about that later because when they talk about the Moors being thrown out of uh, out of Europe, I want to go more into that uh, here later. But later on, the term Moors was used for Arabs. And during the European colonization of Asia, identities like Celion Moor, Indian Moors also came into existence. So again, they're called, they're, they're describing. When they're talking about Moor, they're talking about the description of the person, the skin color of the person. They're saying Moor. So again, um, that's what they're calling Moor here. I just want to be very uh, clear about that. All right? Because Europe likes to say, oh, we put you Moors out because they're using Muslim synonymous with Moors. And that, I'm saying this for a good good uh, reason. As I move on, you're going to understand why I'm saying this. In the United Kingdom, the Moor community has largely consisted of immigrants and their descendants whose residency in the country dates from their time of the old empire. See, they letting you know they're from the ancient world, right, that of the new commonwealth. Black elites developed within the community over the course of several centuries. Its ranks were increased over time by the mixed race children of colonial British aristocrat. Members of the older black elites of British Africa and the Caribbean the rise of black and mixed race national leaders and the success of numerous black mixed race persons in specialized, specialized industries such as the arts. So you have them, you have them going in. Okay, you have these, these black Moors. <laughs> they went into Europe and you have some of them being chased out. Now, I, I, I firmly believe that the Moors when they said they ran the Moors out of of Europe, they ran the Muslims out. There was a disagreement. I think that it, it was a religious disagreement. And the Muslim became the Muslims became a little bit too fanatical. So I believe that there was a some type of issue going on with those Muslim Moors and they was ran out. There were some blacks that stayed. And these are the Moors that you'll see that uh, there are uh, most of them were like Jews or Christians or Catholics. They stayed there. They went on to develop their religion, uh, uh, develop their religion, and continue with their conquest. And the Muslims played a part in that because again, the Muslim was all about conquest and uh, domination. And they were, they participated in the slave trade there in the peninsula. You can see them coming off of Morocco, that peninsula up there through that Atlantic uh, slave trade, bringing in slaves as well. You see those Muslim Moors doing that. Okay, so they participated in that as well. During the slavery, time, slavery times, the white slaveholders, so you have these Moors. You have these Moors that's uh, that's mixing with some of these Europeans, and some of the Moors were slaveholders too. Okay, uh, these slaveholders they were they were getting hold to these indigenous women, especially if they were empresses and princesses, and they had uh, ties to the land. They would force them in sexual relationships, uh, rape them, you know. And later, you know, um, they would keep the children and put them in in a influential status. You know, some of them had caring relationships or caring law, uh, common law marriages to some of these enslaved black women. They sometimes freed some of these black women and their children, but some slaveholders did provide for their mixed race children by ensuring they were educated in the earliest periods they might be apprenticed to uh uh to a trade or a craft so you have these moors that's coming in here 
there began to marry uh there began to marry and become noble men in the European empire. And so they get this status here and they want to keep this nobility going on. And they know in order for conquest to keep getting land, to dominate land, they need to marry these indigenous women. So when they go in to enslave in some of these indigenous countries, they begin, you'll see that in Chancellor Williams' book, they begin to kidnap or abduct some of these women and force them to have babies. That becomes a common law marriage. And now they have access to this land because they're married to this woman. And the patriarchs in their culture, patriarchs rule everything. So this means that they have more property. They own this wife and they own this child. You see what I'm saying? So that, that went on a lot. You'll see that a lot. We'll, I'm going to go more into that in just a minute. You'll see that a lot with these uh, with these Moors. This is how, and this is called Black Nobility. This is how they made a name for themselves. You know, let me move on. Now, here we have Queen Charlotte. This is one of my favorite stories. I talked about this in my book, along with some other biracial uh, people. Princess Sophie Charlotte was born in 1744. She was the first biracial queen of England and the last queen of America. Isn't that something? The last, why are they saying that, that there? Because they claim she was African, but yet they're telling us she's the last queen of, uh, of America. The portrait painters of the royal family were expected to play down a soft in the Queen's Charlotte's African features. They're saying she has African features, but that's not true. She has indigenous Aborigine uh, features, and they're just tying everything back into Africa. And that's for a very good reason, because they're tying everything back to these Moors. Okay, they tie, they, they're completely wiping out ancient America. But yet she's a part, you see, she's the Queen of America. But yes, she has these African features. I digress. She reigned during the American Revolution and was our queen before we became independent. We've never been independent, honey. Uh, we're, we're still under the crown. Charlotte, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina is named after her. It's called the Queen, the city, the Queen City, or something like that. But yeah, Charlotte, North Carolina is named after her. Now here they like to say that. Uh, she has African ancestry. I don't think so. And this is why. According to Mario de Valdez, Charlotte had African ancestry via descent from Margarita de Castro Salza. Did that name sound African? No, I believe this woman was from the Caribbean, Brazil. Uh, you know, her parents, you know. No. I think that the, I did think that that woman was from, you know. Her people was from Brazil, somewhere from the Americas, the island somewhere. Uh, I want to say the Caribbean, um, Brazil, somewhere with that name, Cuba, or Cuba, with that name Castro, because the Spanish had, had colonized them. Mariga de Castro Seva, a 15th century Portuguese noblewoman who traced her ancestry to King Afonso, Portugal, and one of his mistresses. So this woman didn't even know her mother. She just knew her dad. And you see this go on. You see this go on a lot. So she could trace her, her dad back. And even... Uh, uh, via descent from Margarita Castro e Souza, a 15th century Portuguese noble woman. This name don't even sound. It sounds Spanish. You know, again, who traced her ancestry back to King Afonso III of Portugal and one of his mistresses. They don't even name the woman. And you see that goes on that they're, they're um, their ancestry just break off when it comes to knowing more about their mothers. You can't really find that much on their mothers. So you see that goes on a lot 
uh, there even goes on to one, uh, in my research, I found one indigenous woman who was actually uh, abducted and forced to have a baby. So this uh, person, this Morka had nobility. You see a lot of that had went on. And this is called black nobility. This is why uh, you have the Queen Elizabeth and all them that own in so many countries because they went through here when they started enslaving people. They also start in a rape and all that stuff happens when conquest happens, when uh, when war happens. And so they forced uh, some of these women to intermarry because that is the only way that they could have that access to that land like that. Okay, especially indigenous women, indigenous cultures, they had to intermarry so they can own the land. And I talk, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that too. This is gonna make a lot of uh, sense here later. And see how a mother is just mysterious, you know. And this happened to a lot of uh, Aborigine women. Uh, that also happened to the women here in Americas that were Creole. You got these French and Spanish men, uh, the Cajuns and Creoles. You have these uh, French and uh, French and Spanish men coming in marrying these women of color, and they already, you know, they've been tied to the land. They, they, they're uh, Aborigines. They, their land is passed on by mother to mother, and so these these men that. Uh, were pioneers, uh, you know, they're trying to settle into new land. They were marrying these some of these women. You've seen a lot of that go on. So that that story of the Cajun and the Creole that that is not uh, that story is not being fully told. Okay, they were coming in trying to get some of that land, marrying some of these uh, people too, to get access to the land. This is a really good story, which I, I like this. You know, America was getting visits from many nations with dark skin. Don't think that white people just came up in here. No, we were trusting people that look just like us. Uh, what's her name? What is her name? Chief Warhorse. She talked about these jaywalkers, buffalo soldiers look just like us coming in, killing the indigenous people, killing our ancestors. Do not be fooled by skin color. All skin folks ain't kin folks. They came in the name of conquest. Now, these are the same Moors, their descendants. They knew that the Americas was over here. Some of them had been sailing over here. I firmly believe that's why Christopher Columbus was able to find America because he had some Moors with him. Because only the Moors kind of knew this way. Their descendants had already, you know, come in contact with the ancient Egyptians. They knew about the matriarch empire. They knew about us being the ancient people here. Okay, we have the French, the Spanish, and the Dutch trying to stay claim to the land. Okay, this land was the land of of, of lit, uh, milk and honey. Okay, we had we had advanced agriculture. We were already trading globally. Like I told you, you can find some vegetables. Uh, you know, a lot of agriculture uh, that is native and indigenous to Americas. You you can find those in other countries. So this definitely was a matriarch uh, empire that was helping feeding uh, a lot of countries. And not, not many people knew the route to our lands or how big the American empire really was. Because not only are we talking about North America, we're talking about South America, we're talking about Haiti, uh, the Caribbean, Brazil, uh, Hawaii. Uh, the Polynesian nations, we had relationships with them too. Okay, there was an indigenous people there too. There was a big man, and, and Queen Califia would have come in contact with those uh, islands like that. Okay. Now, this is a great story to show that the Moors were definitely. Uh, began to marry Europeans and lay claim, uh, 
you know, they definitely the Moors begin to marry, I'm sorry, uh, the indigenous people here and lay claim to the land. Now, uh, she has a beautiful story. I don't think that she should be calling herself Moors because I really don't think they really understand uh, these people's ancestry of their story. I don't think we should be really calling ourselves Moors. I, I really don't. You know, uh, her story is her her father's mother married this Spanish uh, Mark Marcus Mason, uh, married him, and her mother. Uh, I think his mom's name was Amaria, Amaria, and uh, she was connected to the land. You know, he is the more she is indigenous to the Americas. Okay, he is the more. And she is indigenous to the Americas. They end up getting married. Okay. And you saw that happen when these men will come from Europe and they were like, hey, uh, the Pope or the, the royalty send me. They're getting ready to invade your lands if you don't strike a deal with them. You know, uh, we want we want to come in your come come on this land and we're gonna invade your land. And many of the times what would happen uh, when when this would happen, when people people would say, well, you know, let's just get married and we'll be one big family. That's really what indigenous people did to save their lands, to stop in, uh, invasion of matriarchs. Let's just marry and we can be just one people. Your people can be my people. And it would just be one country. And so that happened here. And so he goes back, the story that I got, as he goes back to uh he goes back and he tells the Catholic people, Hey, I married her and uh we don't we don't have to invade their land. Uh, my people, you know, her people are my people. We're one people now. And the Catholics just like, no, that's not we want the land. Period. Like we want more than that. We're not gonna even recognize this marriage because we're still gonna invade them. So the marriage was never recognized by the Catholic Church. And don't get it twisted. Those very first Catholics that you see in, in Catholicism, they were dark-skinned people. Okay? They were dark-skinned people. The Crusaders. Dark-skinned people. Okay? All skin folks ain't kin folks. And I know we want to believe that. But let me read this, uh, what I got down here. It says, uh, the Dugamile Moors lay claim to the following land by, by and through the bloodlines of the D. Bourbon Estate, also known as the Imperial International Estate of the Bourbon Habsburg Empire, which includes Western Europe, the Netherlands, Belgium, Lex Luxembourg, Switzerland, Switzerland, Germany, Italy, Sicily, Naples, Sardinia, Spain, and Portugal, as well as most of North America and Caribbean, in addition to the Central and South America, and all North America west of the Imperial Demarcation Line or British Royal Proclamation Line. Ownership of most of the North American and other lands belonged to Verdesi. Tierra Washington and her husband, the sixth Marquise Dunn Mason Rouge John Boston. They are the rightful owners of most of America and the lands elsewhere. The problem here is says she's saying that she owned the land through this Moorish man. But this man didn't get this land legally from this woman. Okay, you're not, I don't, you know, I just wouldn't call myself a, a more. I just wouldn't. I wouldn't call myself a more. I just wouldn't. I would not. You know, she's saying that, but it's certainly proof. This is a, a great story of showing how they came over here and start intermarrying with the empresses, uh, the princesses, the matriarchs here on this land. Okay? And, uh, She's associated with Tunica. Uh, their last name was Turner, I think. But this is a great story to show you that uh, we should be calling our, you know, ourselves the Washita Dugamount Empire of the Dugamount in, in, uh, 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 Indians, you know, 
Aborigines, but not Moors. I don't think we're, we're, you know, she got that fez on her head. I, I'm just not feeling it, you know, especially as I go on and I'm seeing uh, what's happening here. You know, I, I just don't, I, I, you know, and then they're so tricky. These Moors are really, really tricky. They're really sneaky with words. They just always be sneaky to me. I don't know. It's just me. This is why we see Moors assisting the United States, a.k.a. the pale face government in colonizing America. Both Europe and the Moors would share the spoils of America. And see, that was the Moors' way, too. When they did this, this was ensure to, to Europe that they would never go to war with them, that they would always look out for them. So when they did this thing together, uh, took over America, these Moors, you see them right there. He's telling them everything. They learned from Freemasonry. Uh, Mason, they learned this from these Moors that learned that from ancient Egypt. Moses would have known everything. They would have carried that with them. Okay? Even Moses, he married this uh, uh, Kippurah. I think she was uh, she was some type of Canaanite. She was some type of prophetess as well. Zipporah, that was her name. So yeah, so you see you see him right there helping George Washington set this up. And both of them, the Moors, they can use them as a front. They can use them as a front to uh, do anything they wanted to do. They didn't have to be on the front line. That's just like having a CEO. I own a company, but I don't have to go in every day. I got the CEO running the company, making sure I keep my cash cow going. He's a, he is a CEO. He's a supervisor. And that's what presidents are. You know, they even have said that George Washington was white. We definitely know that John Hanson, uh, uh, George Washington was black. They de we definitely know that John Hanson was a Moorish. He was a Moorish president. Okay, we have, in fact, we have a group of, of Moorish councils and presidents before we start seeing these people. Again, they, they, uh, they, gained, they gained our trust. They gained our trust. They set up the government. They got it going. And then they let, they let their CEOs or their worker bees in into these higher positions to run the indigenous nation. And that's what happened here. And they still running things right now to this day. Nothing has changed. And I know that's hard to believe, you know. I know that's hard to believe. It's hard for me to believe. Okay, and this will also ensure both parties continue to increase their wealth. What am I saying? These are the Ephraim people who left ancient Egypt. Nobody knows what happened to them people. We're just like, where's the lost tribe of Israel? There's a where's the lost tribe of Israel. And then we have these Israelites, uh, these Jews saying, oh, it's us. Yeah, I can believe that because the Moors kind of married uh, into, you got the Portuguese uh, Jews, you got the Spain Jews. So I believe that you have them intermarrying into these, uh, these white European families. So yeah, they are gonna come back white. Because these Afrian people have, have mixed in with these other people. You know, I don't know if the Jews know their entire, uh, you know, history. But, you know, when you look at their religion, like Hitler says, it's an African religion. What they do is, is it's African. It's indigenous. Okay, that's where they get it from. All right. They would have gotten they wouldn't have gotten their uh religion from Egypt. It all began with Egypt. They still carry that occult esoteric knowledge and they have used this knowledge to set up uh they have used it in conquest and to overthrow other nations. And they learned this from the uh the matriarch culture, the matriarch empire. Okay, this is them. They're showing, you know, these are these Moors. You see the thing on his head. Okay. The black nobility. 
the black nobility of black uh, uh, aristocrats are Roman aristocrats are Roman aristocrat families who sided with the papacy. Don't get it twi uh, twisted or the Roman Catholic Church. The early church was black. These were black people. When they went out getting rid of the matriarchs and all that stuff, that's why you can see uh, these black images in the church of these black saints or these black angels and stuff because these are the more, this is their patriarch story. See, when they first had this story, they got this patriarch story where, you know, they're victims and they're, they, they're, uh, they're telling their weaving their story around these sibyls, these matriarchs. And then more propaganda is put in there. And then you have uh, the European nations also coming together to help them build this book called the Bible. That's why it's coming from King James. That's why you got this Bible coming from King James. It's coming from over there in Europe because these are the black nobles who wrote it. This is their story. But in the book, they, and you know, they try to claim themselves as victims, as slaves. They were not slaves. Matter of fact, if we follow the Jews' history, every time they went somewhere, these people, they were kicked out. If you look at the Jews that, that, that's over there now, that doesn't surprise me. That does it because this was the same behavior of the Moors. The genocide that I'm seeing, you're seeing over there with these, this does not surprise me. It does not surprise me at all because they have a history and because we had to exile these Moors. You see the Muslim Moors being exiled out of Spain. They seem to have this sort of uh, conflicting energy with people. Okay? Despite the relatively recent name, the black nobility has existed for centuries. Originating in the baronical class of Rome and the powerful families who moved to Rome to benefit from the family connection to the Vatican. So you have these Moors, you have these, you know, regular uh, noble people in uh, Moors moving close to the Vatican. Okay, again, these are people of color who establish these places, the black noble nobility. I know it's hard to believe. I said the same thing, but uh, you know, I was like, when I was watching The Wizard of Oz one day and it just clicked in my head, I was like, wouldn't it be funny if the people that was really running this country was black, that was running the world, they were black and wanted us to think that they wasn't running it. And then the exodus crossed my mind. I was like, hmm. Cause I had wrote a, I wrote a book on that. I was like the Exodus. Hmm, that is really and there's no historical evidence of that. And then these Moors come out of nowhere. And then we have all these Egyptian symbolisms everywhere. Hmm. It, I start putting the pieces together. You know, these supported the popes in the governance of the papal states in the administration of the Holy See. And the Holy See is acting like God. You know, the same thing as Moses. Moses was the only one who communicated with this God. You know, he was the only one, could have, the other, the Israelites, you know, they nobody could talk to him uh, but Moses. So now you have this Pope, this Holy See, he the only one that can talk to God, this patriarch God. They are also the hidden hand that moves the world. White people are only representatives of the black nobility. For the life of me, I couldn't put it together about this black nobility. The only thing I could think about was about the exodus. They are definitely black and they don't consider themselves as black people. They don't think they're the same as us. They do not. They do not. All skin folks ain't kin folks, so keep that in mind, okay? Especially, you know, let's be careful with these patriarchs. Let's leave here and we're going to watch a few more clips and I'm going to put everything together. I know this is a long video, but I thought it was worth it to go more into the Moors and really uh, inform you about the black nobility. Okay, I see we'll go to the next clip. Where? It is extremely important, not only for our people, 
but for everybody on this planet to wake up to what's going on. May 4th of 2020, Donald Trump sent this form over to the owner of the United States Corporation, informing them that they were bankrupt and they needed to cough up the collaterals and whatnot. Say, bro, the nigga name is at the top of this form, bro. Look, Roger Allen Moore. Raphael, a Mexican Moore. He's the same dudes Rod Hayes was talking about when he was saying they look like us, but they ain't us. The black hands, the people at the top pulling the strings look just like me and you. Y'all gotta really read this shit, man. This shit deep. Next day, they went and raided Trump right after he put this form out. Come on. But the president ain't even the owner of the United States Corporation. He just the CEO. They just all front man. See the title he go by? A Mexican Moore. They even got his tax identification number on this shit, man. Yeah, Trump went crazy on this dude, bro. Yeah, so these people are the real secret families hiding in the backgrounds with the black hands. So these people control the justice system. They control the money. They control Hollywood. They control the media, all that. These black nobles are really humanoid reptilians. They the same type that Tarnish and Halo was. A lot of these beings gonna look like this. I'ma just flat out and tell you, bro. See the whole concept of white versus black was created solely for the purpose of separation. And that the real individuals behind the president, behind Congress, the hidden hand, is also melanated, nine ether people also. What if I told you that? The individuals you see in the illustration behind me I refer to as the black nobility. These are the original 13 families, okay? These are melanated, carbonated individuals. Everything we've ever been told, okay, in reference to who we believe the enemy is, so to speak, has been solely for the purpose of distraction, okay? Now, again, there are no relevant uh, Caucasian individuals that did wholeheartedly embraced that role, okay, that they were set to play. But this actually derived from our own melanated people selling us out. Look at some of the old relics from Europe. You'll see that these individuals were black people, okay, that they commemorated, that they highly revered. You could find a lot of the real ancient relics in the Vatican. Um, they had statues and all kind of things to commemorate the black nobility. Thirteen families all have the blood of the black draconian. Um, the individual you see to my left, and the illustration behind me is referred to as Tarnush or Halal, okay? This was a black draconian. This is who Ra Hayes making reference to when he say they look like us, but they not us. These are reptilians, okay? And oftentimes they have the pointed ears and a widow's peak is a genetic uh, trait. Free the elder god, Dr. Malachi Z. York, he spoke on these entities in the, uh, in the holy tablets, okay? This is a depiction, okay, of how these individuals look. They're reptilian, they are shapeshifters, and they are black. They are normal melanated. This is a depiction of how some of them may look. They look like us, but they're not us. Here's another example, okay? Black reptilian, black draconian. They figured if they create, if they could create an enemy for us, then we wouldn't uh, think about them, okay? And that's why one of their names, code names, basically is the hidden hand. They don't, they're the biggest secret that most people don't talk about. Tarnush is the son of Marduk. I hope you ain't missed this on Ye Ren, because this gotta get broken down. He exposed credible sources showing them as white. The paintings and historical records suggest that all European queens and princesses were white. But the truth is quite the opposite. Today we know that various European women aristocrats, princesses and queens were black, which you should know about. We In this video, we covered a lot, Some, you know, within this album we have covered a lot. Well, that is a lot. So, we got the Sumerians. That's from Ur, Abraham. He's going into Egypt. And they're there for, you know, for some centuries. They get out of there. Moses, they're exiled from there. Believe me, they were exiled. They were, they were not enslaved. They left with a lot of knowledge and science and math. Uh, they go on to the Iberia, Iberia Peninsula. Uh, they overthrow that kingdom and they are settled in there. They go into Europe and they become uh, aristocrats. They bring in the Renaissance uh, and the Moors are in there. They are procreating with the women there uh, so fast and they, they really like uh they really like the european women there so there was a lot of demand for them for the moors uh, i don't hear too many uh, people talk about if the moors had wives going in there you know but there's definitely talk of them going into europe and and all you know they darken spain 
they went in there so there was a lot of pro re, uh, procreating going on there uh, something happens with the Muslim Moors where they're, they are ran out of Europe or Spain however there are some that stay there and they intermix and they become uh, noble barons and aristocrats and royalty they they get in into that they teach them mace freemasonry all of that is being taught there in europe and so they've been there for quite a while and the europeans want to make sure hey that they don't turn on them so they decide to do conquests together and to intermarry and the main thing is to get these lands up under the crowns and the catholic church was in on it too because these Sumerians, they had their knowledge, they had their um, their story written down that was surrounded about around the matriarch story. It was weaved into that because these women, many of them were sibyls or they knew about the sacred rituals, you know, of the goddess. They had they, they were very tapped into the divine feminine. And so they married these women who had a connection with the ancient world or with the ancient uh, prophetess that was around during that time and so you have them writing their story and then the Europeans okay you have these patriarchs together they're sharing their story they're founding their religion a new spiritual practice to bring women in as well so they got to get these people because this is a spiritual people they've been under the matriarch culture for so long so you have the Christians, and believe me, the early church were dark-skinned people. There's no way they would have been able to go into a lot of these places if they were not dark-skinned people. A lot of these people were dark. Not all of them were, you know, uh, light-complected people, especially the early church. That's why you'll see in the early church, the early saints, they are dark-skinned people, okay? And so you have them creating this Jesus. Jesus is very deceptive. You need to be very careful with this this Jesus because when it gets to the Council of Nicaea and no one, you know, everybody, you're in an uproar like, no, don't do this, don't do this, this can't be right. But they are determined to put this patriarch masculine God over the whole world. It became a global thing because first it was the matriarchs. You understand? The Council of Nicaea is so important because it's flipping from matriarch to patriarch. They set that in stone with Jesus. When they set Jesus up like that and that Council of Nicaea, and they, they, they decided to make this a, a universal global thing. They What they did... <laughs> It is is uh they set up a whole new entity in in the energy shift. Now, what I do believe too that the Moors they did have a leverage with that some outside force. So you see when they talk about that in black nobility, they think that these aliens are, you know, they're talking about the Anunnaki, where the Sumerian patriarchs. You don't see these Anunnaki come into play until the Sumerian patriarchs are put put in power. Then you see these Anunnaki. And but the Anunnaki spin off from the matriarch Eniana. Those 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 uh deities was in, in place first before we get this Anunnaki. And then it's something because now this Anunnaki has a alien out of sight like presence that's going on there when we start to look at this Anunnaki. But they did a good job trying to build on top of the matriarch uh, Pathanon. And that's and if you look at the Anunnaki and you start to do research on it, you will see that's not the first Pathanon. That's, those are the patriarchs made that up. And so it, become, it, it looks alien form. That's why I say it was some type of force they came in contact with the, for this to happen. For them to, to have this power to overthrow like they did. There was some force of the force guiding them. I'm not going to deny that they wasn't in contact with some other force. Now, I don't know if it was divine or not. Again, these are some uh, Sumerians. They would have been using Babylonian magic. 
they were skilled at Babylonian magic. Uh, fun magic. You know, you'll see that in the Bible, you'll see a lot of that sun magic. I think that came from the Chaldeans. You can go look that up through the Chaldeans, but you will see that there. But these Moors, they come back, they circle back, and when they get in Europe and they have gotten all the lands, lands under the crown, under Queen Elizabeth, because you see Queen Charlotte, she was named Queen of America. So some point they came in contact with a matriarch who was royal and she became an heir. Okay? Queen Charlotte became an heir and now she she was queen. Uh, they said she was the last queen of America. Okay, this is what they said. So, and when you go back and look at a lot of these Moorish children, especially when they talk about it hidden colors and they became royal, royalty and noble men and aristocrats, uh, they became good in their craft or, or skill. Nine times out of 10, these children come from indigenous Aborigine women, women who were forced to have children by some of these men. Some of the men were uh, Caucasian, and some of them were Moorish, depending on, you know, their goal for you. But you, they, they were, they, you were going under the crown. They needed to have these earths under the crown in order to have control over the land. And many of the matriarchs had ownership of the land because land was passed through mother to mother to mother because they were hunters. I mean, they were gatherers and ag they were good in agriculture. So the land belonged to them. And so many of them inherited the land. And they were empresses, princesses, to seek, you know, other names they may have had for these women. That's why it's so hard to find them because in Deja's, uh cultures, there would be different names for princesses and uh, empresses and things like that. But you can, uh, I am going to do, um, try to post a video on some of that real soon. I'm going to talk about that in the video. And then you see these Moors come over here. And, and so is the Muslims because they're right there on the Iberia Peninsula. They're right there. And they knew that ancient Egypt stretched to America. They knew America was ancient Egypt. And that the Egypt set up in Africa is on a colonization of the ancient Egypt in America. We colonized that. America's and you we're going to find out soon that America colonized a lot of places. We contributed to uh feeding the global population. A lot of foods you see around the world are native to America. You're going to find that out too. This is the ancient land. And so the patriarchs they they fulfilled their dominance. They wanted to conquer the west world and they did that. They came back. They were very upset. I think more than anything with the uh with the patriarchs, they were very upset being exiled and not being listened to. I don't know what they were asking for or what that civil dispute was about, but they came back with the vengeance. And they they were very, you know, I just think it's very conniving and deceiving the way these Moors come back and circle back and and set up this U.S. government and start putting all these countries under the crown. As you'll see, that is, that is the black nobility. That's why they call it black. It's nothing legal about it. it, it you know, most of that happened through rape, through betrothed, women not wanting to uh, be under, have their lands under the crown like that. But that's why you'll see Queen Elizabeth and you will see most of the lands are under the crown. And you best believe they already con conquer Africa. It would take dark people to do what they do. Look at what happened in Rwanda. It would take dark people to do what they do. These people, you know, they hiding under under the crown, you know, under the crown of uh 
Queen Elizabeth and these other royalties. But believe me, there's dark skinned people. These Moors are are the puppeteers behind it. It's just like the Wizard of Oz. You you pull back the curtain and there they are. The black nobility. The people look just like me and you, but they don't they don't they don't think that they're black. They don't call themselves that. Okay, and they wasn't calling themselves e Hebrews and Israelites or Jews when they left Egypt. They weren't calling themselves that. Now, the Jews that you see now, yeah, they possibly they got an African religion, so yeah, they possibly came in contact with these Moors and learned some of that. They possibly did, you know. And and when you look at the history of the Jews, everywhere they went, they were exiled out of there too. They were exiled. They they contributed a lot to society, but they were exiled because of their uh their business practices. They would put people in debt. And you kind of see that, and you kind of see that with the Moors as well. Again, they taught that Egyptian Freemasonry. You got Moses coming out of Egypt, and he taught that Freemasonry uh, to the Sumerians. Okay, to these people, it, it just further enhanced their skills, especially when it came to ritual, structure, and organization that only enhanced it. So now you got these people, um, they're in control. You got these Jews are in where they're in now. They're still in control because they're under the crown. Don't forget, they participated in slavery, too. They we participated in that. And they're still participating in the demise of, of the original people. They're still doing it. Okay, so, you know, there's set definitely something going on here, beloved. We've covered a lot of information. I hope you found this information insightful and that it informed you about what's moving and shaking in this world. And I probably it probably shift your perspective on a lot of things. It definitely shift my perspective, especially when they got to talking about um, the reptilians. I'm not saying I doubt it. I've just never experienced it before. I've never had that experience, but I definitely know that the patriarchs came in contact with some sort of force that helped them bring this energy into this realm and have control the way they do in its, its capacity today. And it's going to take women walking away from churches, walking away from politics to overturn this because that they have used that as a force to be reckoned with. Just walking away from the churches and politics, we start taking back the power from patriarchs. We have to, you know, not ask for permission, but use our sovereign right to govern ourselves. That is what we we have the right to do. It's very important for us to understand that it is the best way to fight these people. It's not through violence, but it, through your sovereignty liberty and freedom don't even argue with them because they took that away from you when they tried to control you and put you into their religion you had to go there by force but now with the knowledge and power that you have today you can change that and get back your 100 percent sovereignty your power because we've given so much away and it was a bloodbath trying to get there so many ancient mothers so many you know matriarchs died for them to put this in place that's why i'm so passionate about bringing this knowledge there um sharing my insights with you you know you do your own research but these are my insights and these are my theories and and other people have saw it too so i just i'll just leave this here and let you do what you will with it. Thanks for being here with us today, beloved. Light, love, namaste, ashe, loved one.